uh, it's a journey, isn't it, this life? This life is a journey. There's a lot of ups and downs, and, and you know, there's things that go in our life. Maybe sometimes during this, this time you've had down times and, and up times, I'm sure. But hopefully when you come to church, you can put a lot of that away and be lifted up. We want you to be encouraged and inspired sometimes, for sure. Well, this week, a lot of youngins are going back to school or start learning at home. And so, just want to say a prayer for all of you uh, going to school. I know it's different in a lot of ways. And if you're learning at home, I know that's going to be different in a lot of ways. So, just want to say, have a prayer of peace for all of you and for you to have a great year, okay? Please bow with me. Father God, thank you so much for this day that we have. Father God, as you know, this world gives us struggles. Uh, but Father God, we rejoice so much in all the blessings that we have. And one of the great blessings that we rejoice in is our children. And, and as our children are going back to school or learning at home, Father God, I pray great blessings upon all of them, everybody who's involved in teaching them. Help them to have great years and please be with the parents that are teaching at home and bless them with courage and, and success doing it that way as well. We love you, Lord. We know that you are the cure for everything that we need. And I hope the kids have, just have a wonderful time with good experiences. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to be talking about judging today. So, who's guilty of judging? Okay, we can all raise our hand, right? You know, it's interesting, uh, as, a, as a minister, as a preacher, uh, I talk about things that I'm also guilty of. You know, if you could only speak about things that you are 100% on the right side all the time, how many of us would be able to speak about anything? Really nothing, right? Because we all struggle with so many things, and this is no different than others. And so this particularly, I bring it up, because judging is something that a lot of people say, well, you know, they come with that attitude when we talk to them about something, and we are in a sensitive society right now, aren't we? So I'm going to read this again. I appreciate uh, Dan reading this. He did a good job. So Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the same way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Oh, how you... Say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. And behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. All right? This is probably one of the funnest uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount to act out. If you're in a youth group and acted these out, I know we did that. It's kind of fun. And actually, you may accidentally hit someone with a plank while you're acting it out. And so this idea of judging was a problem in the time of Jesus. Uh, I believe judging is a problem today as well, isn't it? Uh, but back then, they were being judged by a whole lot of people. There was a big issue of the Pharisees judging over harshly, right? They would come in as the leaders of the Jewish people and come in and say, you should not do that. Well, obviously, at times, they would do the opposite. And so... Part of the sermon this morning, I want us to talk about how you should go through this judging process. But Jesus, like Dan said, this is all red letter here. That this is Jesus saying this. And Jesus knows very well about judging, doesn't he? How are we going to be judged? We're going to be judged by the words of Jesus right here. And so if you don't like something that Jesus says, you can't just wipe it away. Well, that's just not practical. No, we need to put this into practice. So Jesus says a lot about this, about judging others. Today we judge with little hope of redemption. Have you noticed that? That you could have done something 20 years ago, and if people find that out, then that negates everything that you've ever done or, or aspirations of doing. And maybe the someone that did that wrong maybe doesn't even remember it. It's like, did I do that? Oh, that's not good. And so... It's interesting how we have this, this culture nowadays of big-time judging. And it really gives us a fear, doesn't it? If you're like me, it makes you want to put as little as possible out in public. Maybe less on Twitter, less on Facebook, because eventually it's going to come back and haunt you. 
Good thing there's not many recordings of me saying things. Oh, there are. I can, I can be called a hypocrite many times. As I say, don't judge, don't do other things, because we all struggle with these things. Is perfection something that we expect from everybody? Or anybody, really? Now, it's interesting because we say that we don't really expect perfection from everybody or anybody, but yet sometimes, depending on the person, we hold them to that standard. Doesn't make sense, but yet we do that. So as you judge, you will be judged. Now, Jesus started this little uh, talk about judging with this right here. As you judge, you will be judged. Now, that's very sobering. Because when you say you're wrong about something, as you were taught as a little kid, when you point, how many fingers are pointing back at you? Three more, right? You're wrong there. Oh, yes, I'm wrong. And every day we can see, at the end of the day, if you're like me, you kind of think about things that you could have done differently, things you should have done, things you shouldn't have done, or things you should have done differently. And you think about, oh, I was wrong there, or I could have done something differently. Now, you can't go back in time, but you can make amends, and you can try to learn from that. But where it gets different is when you try to talk with someone about something they've done wrong. It's difficult, isn't it? Now, Jesus... Did he judge anybody while he was here? A few times, didn't he? Even in Matthew, he called a group of people vipers. It's kind of, kind of strong terminology, calling people snakes. Uh, hopefully you haven't done that today. But we are in this cancel culture mentality that we cancel people and say, okay, you don't have any more voice nowadays because you did something wrong. And something I see that we do a lot is we judge people's motives. You know, when you see someone do something wrong, I think you can come up and ask them, why did you do that? Or what, is the, what was the, the reason behind that? Did you know you did that? Well, I see nowadays, when you see something that you don't like, then everything comes full force. Okay, judgment, and this is what's going to happen, and you're done. Now, that's not very inviting, isn't it? And that's why I said that, that idea of judging without redemption. I love redemption. We all need redemption in your relationship with other people, in your family, uh, and with the world. Now, hopefully, one thing that we have in church is we have promise and hope of redemption. To say, you know what, you've done wrong, come back, and we would accept you, and let's move forward. Forgiveness and move forward. Forgiveness and move forward. That needs to be part of our mantra, isn't it? Trying to do right, but not focusing on the wrongs that we've done. And so, this idea of judging. And I picked this picture. It took a while to pick the picture I wanted. This idea of a Bible, the book there, and you had the scales, and then you had that judgment mallet there. Now, some people, unfortunately, they read the Bible to use it to judge people. It said, that's not why the Bible was given to us, so we can pronounce condemnation on someone else. The Bible was given to us so we can instruct each other to get to God. Now, there's some judgment involved there, and we're going to talk about that. But the Bible's not given to us to tell people that they're going to hell and don't have hope. The Bible is given to us so we can say, you're going to hell, but there is great hope to get to heaven. So judge. So nowadays, with this cancel culture mentality, many have been convinced never to judge. Okay, never judge at all. Well, look, look at this great thinker, Ziggy, here. So this is written here. This mouse is in the refrigerator. He says, now, now, let's not jump to conclusions here. All right? You have the mouse there in the refrigerator by the cheese. Okay? And that cheese didn't start off with Swiss cheese either. All right? And so, obviously, what's the conclusion that we have? This mouse is eating this cheese. All right? All the evidence points towards that, right? But even the mouse is saying, don't jump to conclusions. And you can just see Ziggy. He's angry. <laughs> I'm joking. Z I don't think I've ever seen the angry Ziggy before. Uh, and so, the world says, you don't know me. How can you judge? All right? You can never judge me. You can never say I've done anything wrong. Because look at you. 
the mouse in the world would say, oh, and you're going to eat all this cheese, right? And so it's interesting how we are in a strange time of saying who can judge and who can't judge. Ephesians 5, 11 through 13 says, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. Okay, exposing that idea. So at some point we have to judge what darkness is, right? If we're going to expose something for being bad, then you have to make some kind of judgment call, right? So judging, how many times do we judge a day, you think? Fifty? <laughs> we make judgment calls all the time, right? What you wear, what you eat, uh, when to make a right turn. You know, we make judgments all the time. Do I trust this person? Okay. We, this happens all the time. And so what Jesus was talking about, don't do these, these uh, damning judgments so easily. But you need to think about it. That's why he brings up that speck and the log in the eye. Okay. So we need to expose it with light. And what is light? It's Jesus, isn't it? It's the Word of God is light. So don't just come with your opinion, well, you're wrong because I don't like it. Well, if you're going to expose a wrong with light, then you should come with the Bible. You should come with some understanding. And so we better know the light. We need to know the Bible well. Because it's not enough to say, well, you're wrong by that terminology well, is that worth getting in a fight about anyways, terminology? If the Bible really isn't clear about something, then I would probably let it, lo let it lie most of the time, okay? So when you think about this, how to do this, this judging aspect, when to judge, when to draw conclusions. And uh, I'm reminded of a story, and there's this four people sitting in a train. They're going on a long trip, okay? It's a... High general and his underling lieutenant that helps take care of a lot of things. They're sitting on one bench, and they're facing a grandmother and her beautiful granddaughter right there. And pretty quickly, the general and the grandmother notice there's some kind of attraction between the lieutenant and the beautiful granddaughter. You know, they kind of kind of look at each other, peek a look, you know, get kind of shy, whatever. And they go through a tunnel. And they're in the tunnel, and you hear the smack of a kiss and a smack of a slap okay and then you come out of the tunnel and they're all kind of looking at each other all right and uh so it's just interesting you know the, the beautiful young girls thinking wow i'm glad he kissed me but i wish my grandmother wouldn't have slapped him you know it's just too bad and the grandmother's thinking the nerve of that guy kissing my granddaughter, but I'm so proud that she slapped him. And the general's thinking, wow, I don't blame my lieutenant kissing that beautiful young girl, but why did she slap me? <laughs> so then the lieutenant's thinking, what a day. I got to kiss a beautiful girl and get to slap my commanding officer. <laughs> All right? You see how everybody there is jumping to some kind of conclusion. And who knows what's the truth? Only the guy who did it. But is anybody going to ask about anything after that happened? Not while they're in the car. No. Afterwards it might happen. I don't know how those conversations went. But see how people jump to conclusions. Because they already had it played out in their mind, right? They already had things played out in their mind before the situation comes. Sad to say we do this a lot. If someone's going to talk to me about religion or politics, we we'll already have the scenario played out and we jump. We have to calm down a little bit and maybe ask questions and maybe listen a little bit more. And then in the end, let things go. Can we do that? Now hopefully as a church, we can help lead the way in these things. It means that people are going to disagree with us, and we're going to disagree with them. Okay? It's going to happen. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit on how to have these conversations with people. All right? 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13 says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do, not judge, do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside God judges? Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. And Paul wrote this saying, uh, you know, people uh, will remember what Paul had said earlier, don't deal with immoral people. And so they were not dealing with people in the world. And he says, if we don't deal any with immoral people, then we won't have anything to do with the world. He was talking about don't deal with immoral people in the church family. Okay? If someone's immoral out in the world, they're not believers, so I'm not going to have anything to do with them. <clears throat> There's some wisdom to that. You don't want to be tainted with them. But at some point, you have to deal with them at some point. Because how do we bring them to Christianity if we don't have any relationship with them at all? So we need to focus on holding each other accountable. We need to focus on this aspect before we think about holding the world accountable. Because I understand we all struggle with sin. But if people come here to visit and we are just a mess, and people will see hypocrisy amok too bad, then that's not good, okay? Uh, Alex and Kayla have been visiting with us lately. No, Alex and Kayla from Fort Hill Christian Camp. So glad they've been coming the last few weeks. And my kids know them from camp. It's pretty cool. They're great people. Hopefully you can meet them. But if they came to visit and they just see like little pockets of people gossiping about one another, then how inviting is that? Hopefully when people come visit, they can see a diverse group unified about Jesus. Okay? A diverse group unified about Jesus. Look here at Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Brethren, even if anyone is called in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such one, a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. Okay? I love that idea of bearing their own load, but we help each other. So family, restore your spiritual sick family. I think that is so key. If you know who someone's spiritually sick, someone who's maybe not come to church, check in on them in a loving, gentle way. Or if you know there's a sin that's going on in the church, you have to deal with it. Okay? You have to deal with it. You must examine yourself. And this is something that we should do all the time. And hopefully we are happy when someone, after they examine themselves, says, I did wrong and I need to do better. Now, does that mean they're never going to make that mistake again? Probably not. If someone really struggles with something, they're going to have slip-ups, okay? And the devil knows it. The devil knows it. The devil knows our weaknesses, and he's going to try to exploit those and take advantage of them. And he'll whisper to us, oh, because you messed up, it's, you're gone. You know they won't accept you again. You know the cancel culture. Once they find this out, they're going to be done with you. I want you to know it's not true. The church here, we understand we all sin. There may be some judgment to say, okay, yes, that's wrong, that's sin, but we have forgiveness as well, praise God. And we are not the only ones that need to be forgiven. All of us need to be forgiven. So if you've done wrong, fine. I do wrong as well. But we have forgiveness. We embrace one another, we forgive one another, and we move on. Not focusing on what happened in the past, but focus on what the future can be. Right? That's how we need to have. So your attitude as you talk to someone in this situation should be an attitude of humbleness. Humbleness, knowing that you're guilty just like everybody else is guilty. And so that judgment, when you pound that gavel and judgment in your mind, understand you're pronouncing judgment on yourself as well. Because as, as you are humble and give forgiveness, then it will be given to you as well. 
And so judgment needs to be done, of course. And so we don't judge the world. Oh, the, what we do, obviously, they are struggling. They're going to hell because they don't have Jesus. So there's no reason to point out, you're lying. You shouldn't be living with that person. Their issue is they don't have the gospel. So that's our, our talk with them. It's like, you need the gospel in your life. You need hope and love and joy. Then after they become part of our family, then really we can work on these fine tunings about things. That's the gospel. That's why I think Jesus came to the Jewish people to correct them. Guys, you have to get your act in line because I'm going to send you out to the world. It's so important. So in order, I want to go to the plank and speck now. We need to be able to see well. Okay? We need to be able to see well. So I say proudly, my fellow hypocrites, hello. I'm a hypocrite, you're a hypocrite, but hopefully we can be loving, forgiving hypocrites. Uh, sometimes people will say to me, I don't want to go to church, a bunch of full of hypocrites. I was like, we can always use another one. Come on. And I like you as a hypocrite. You are a very good hypocrite. We just need to own it. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We all do, right? So let's not put on the airs that we've got it all figured out, but we're put on the airs of we're trying to get it figured out, and we're going to help each other as we struggle and slip, okay? That's just the life that Jesus wants us to have. So I have a little video here I want us to look at. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, you mind if I eat lunch with you? No, hey, come on, have a seat. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, you got on someone's shirt right there. Oh, oh, where? where? Down, down there, on your shirt. Uh, I'm still, I'm still not seeing it. It's as plain as the face on your nose. Don't you need the nose on your face? Okay, whatever that is on your shirt, it's really starting to gross me out. Uh, I still don't see. Did I drop something on my shirt? Does it run like a duck swim in a circle? I can't believe you don't see it. It's, it's so obvious. Oh, you mean this crumb? Yeah, finally. I wish you could see how messy your shirt looks. I act that out every day when I eat lunch. No, isn't that just a good idea? Has anybody ever come to you about something you've had, maybe something wrong in your life, but yet they are like 10 times worse? Well, how about you? Have you ever gone to someone about something and maybe you're 10 times worse? We've played both sides of this, to be honest, and we probably will again. But with humbleness, wouldn't it be good that we can help each other to see better. We can help each other with, with your flaws and my flaws, but it's difficult, okay? Uh, do you know what the definition of constructive criticism is? It's when I criticize you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but usually when people receive criticism, they don't like it. I don't like it, no one likes it. But the goal is to get healthy, to get better. And as a church family, hopefully we can do that. So strive to see well. Strive to take away the things in your eyes that keep you from seeing so well. And try to set people up for success. I tell you what, if you, you know, cancel someone and judge them so harshly, and other people see that, then do you think they're going to come to you when they have troubles, when they have struggles? I think not. They're going to see, wow, I see how he or she talked to that person. I'm going to hopefully they won't know anything that goes on in my life. Okay, so we need to be careful with that. John 7, 24, Jesus said, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Interesting, isn't it? This is red letter as well. So he says, apparently, it's okay to judge, but we need to judge with righteous judgment. What does that mean? Well, with correct judgment, with good judgment. We should judge righteously and not worldly. I don't like how the world judges, do you? And they tell us 
how to judge. You have to accept these people as approved by God, whoever that is. But the Bible says, the Bible's old. Get the updated version. It's like, well, I don't think I need to do that. We don't need to take our lead from the world. We need to take our lead from Jesus. 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26 says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, as they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. I tell you what, isn't it great? The instruction here is action and not gossip. And I understand you might need to talk to someone, hey, did you see what so-and-so did? That wasn't good, was it? Okay, that's okay, but then you need to move on it. We need to talk to him and see if we can help in some way. Not condemn, but help. But if we only talk about it, if we only talk about the person, then that's gossip. What good is it other than making yourself feel righteous, saying, good, I'm not that person. Good thing I'm better than that person over there. No. If you talk about someone's problem without helping, without praying about it, then it's gossip. But God wants us to move and act to help. Because hopefully, if we do so gently and calmly, we can help save their soul. Okay? We all need this. We all need this. As we wrong people at times, and people call us out, hopefully they're gentle and calm, and that judging, and say, ha ha! That's sad, isn't it? If we had that kind of idea that people are ready to jump at each other. Now, as a church, let's love and embrace. Let us look for ways of how to encourage one another, and that when the judgment gavel comes down, it ends with saved. By the grace of Jesus Christ, the judgment is saved by Jesus Christ. I want you to experience that. I want you to know that. And when you know that you're saved and you're receiving the grace of Jesus, it's much easier to give it to others. What a blessing to give righteous judgment that saves and doesn't condemn. But it's all about Jesus. It begins and ends with Jesus here. And so... Please, if you haven't known Jesus, if you haven't taken him in baptism, this is the time to do it. Please come forward as we sing this song.